Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Coco Khan. On today's show, the return to Stormont. Just days before the two year anniversary of the collapse of power sharing, are the people of Northern Ireland finally getting their government back? And what's it like to be a 20 something MP working in a crumbling old building surrounded by equally crumbling old MPs? One time baby of the house, Nadia Whitam, will be here to tell us what turned her onto politics so young and why it's important for young people's views and experiences to be represented in Parliament. Hi, Coco. <laughs> Sorry. Why are you immediately I just laughing? Don't know. Like, I feel like you're going to put me on the spot. Why am I going to put you on the spot? All I ever ask you is how are you and what's have been happening in your week. Do me a favour. Don't ever be grilled on the news. If if what have you been up to is causing you to crumble mentally. <laughs> I've just had, it's just one of those things, like lots of deadlines all on top of each other. So I've been working a lot. And one of the things I find, I don't know if it's the same for you, but when I go through these periods where I'm working a lot, these sprint periods where I'm really involved, yeah. I go, I just go completely. <laughs> Completely feral, basically. What do you mean completely feral? Just you start, like, like rubbing yourself in mud and living <laughs> in the trees. No, just like when I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror, I'm like, oh, fuck it now. You know, like but, I, I look yeah. unkempt. I look unclean. I find that I go through these because also I'm not seeing anyone. I'm quite a social animal, as you know about me. Yeah. So if I don't see people, it's like I become, I lose my civil civilizational skills. I think it's just hard for people to um, compute you being completely feral because obviously a lot of people listen to the podcast, but also you can watch the podcast on YouTube. And you obviously look extremely put together. And I look like I've come to the studio every week, fresh from being on the run from the police. <laughs> like every week, it looks like somebody found me in a hedge. But that's but that's very on trend. Is it? Yeah. If you're not, are you not? Everybody's doing it, darling. Timothy Chalamet, he's also I, doing I think this. I'm not sure there's any comparison between me and Timothy Chalamet that can be legitimately made. Well, is there an, if I find old pictures of you, is yeah. there a moment where you were trying out a different look? No, were I... Were you doing a kind of like, I'm David Gandhi moment? I'm looking into <laughs> the middle distance. I am... You know, chiselled, I am clean. <laughs> I no, am... there's never okay. been a period of that. In 2020, when we were doing, when I was doing a TV show from my house because of the pandemic, I tried to trim my beard and accidentally shave the whole thing off. <laughs> and my girlfriend said I looked like the 18-year-old intern. <laughs> and she didn't mean it as a compliment. She wasn't like, it's taken years off you. She's like, you look awful. <laughs> you look genuinely terrible. I would love to see you without a beard. You got any photos? Yeah, I've got loads of photos. I'll, I, I mean, I, I'll post them on... I'll, I'll send them to the producers <laughs> and they can put them on the YouTube clips. It's but, funny, isn't it? Because you can know someone so well, but do you really know them if you haven't seen their chin? Uh, I, I think I look considerably worse without a beard. My mum's like, you should get rid of the beard. But when I was That's a kid, my mum used to like. make me, my mum used to tell the hairdressers that I had a set side parting, <laughs> which obviously for my hair is impossible it's absolutely impossible so these people would these poor hairdressers would try and find the side parting <laughs> in the nest that is my hair and i'd end up coming out of it looking like samuel l jackson in unbreakable <laughs> where he's got this sort of lopsided afro oh i love the idea of baby lopsided <laughs> That's so sweet. my last question about the beard because i've always Wanted to have a beard. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. I like the aspect of, because sometimes I put on different hats. And yeah. when I put on a different hat, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean, like, I have hats and yeah, sometimes sure. I wear different hats. It's amazing how people treat you differently. If I wear a cap, yeah. I get one response. If I wear a hat, you know, with a brim, yeah. I might, I get a different response. Well, if I... So if you wear a beard, I'm I, just curious. If I trim my beard nicely, I look like a sort of respectable businessman. Yeah. At the moment, I look like I've been on the run from the law, and if I shave it into a moustache, I immediately go on a register. How low can you get it? How long can you get it? How long can I get my beard? Yeah. It goes long. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we're you... talking like I'm a I'm a teacher of wisdom? Are you... we talking that level of beard? Or... No, no, no. It's like uh, I'm wanted for war crime somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's full like you're watching this VHS of me threatening the West. <laughs> 
imagine having no proper functioning government for nearly two years. That's been the reality for the people of Northern Ireland, but it seems the wait might finally be over. Following a tense meeting of the Democratic Unionist Party's executive in County Down, which lasted over five hours, the DUP's leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, finally emerged at 1am on Tuesday morning to confirm that an agreement had been reached for them to return to a power-sharing government. We recognise that significant further advances have been achieved through these negotiations and the details of the new package of measures will be published by the UK Government in due course. This package, I believe, safeguards Northern Ireland's place in the Union and will restore our place within the UK internal market. It will remove checks for goods moving within the UK and remaining in Northern Ireland and will end Northern Ireland automatically following future EU laws. The DUP caused the collapse of the country's devolved government, the Northern Irish Assembly, nearly two years ago when they walked out in protest against post-Brexit trade agreements that have created trade barriers between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We discussed this in an earlier episode of this podcast with the SDLP's Matthew O'Toole, that is definitely worth listening back to, where we also discussed the toll a lack of a functioning government has had on the country. Now look, it's worth explaining the Northern Ireland government operates under a power-sharing model devised as part of the Good Friday Agreement. Unlike a more usual political coalition where at least two parties agree to govern together, it's mandatory for Northern Ireland's political parties to share power. There must be representatives from both nationalist parties who want Irish unity and unionists who want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. The details of the deal agreed between the DUP and the government will be presented in the Commons later today after we record this. But let's talk to Belfast-based journalist Amanda Ferguson, who's been following developments from Stormont. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. Can you just talk us through the dramatic events of the week that have brought us to this point today? What we've seen this week is Sir Geoffrey Donaldson finally move to a position uh, where he can make a decision and get the endorsement of his party uh, to head back into the power sharing government. So the DUP had quite dramatic um, meetings that had protests outside and uh, lots of very tired reporters waiting around. And there had been a uh, press conference scheduled for, for half ten that didn't end up taking place until one in the morning. Uh, it was in a whiskey distillery though, so I, I did have a little dram uh, while I was there. <laughs> uh, but essentially, essentially what, what, what we know is that while Sir Geoffrey Donaldson acknowledges that what he's achieved for his party and for unionists in Northern Ireland isn't perfect, it's a, it's a vast improvement on what was there before and those post-Brexit trading arrangements that he had such concerns about, he feels more reassured uh, about the UK government's position and the UK and the EU have agreed uh, that um, Northern Ireland's uh, place in the internal UK market is restored as unionists would view it. And then also the constitutional concerns that unionists have were kind of already taken care of by the 1998 Good Friday Agreement peace deal. So the, the peace deal was always very clear that Northern Ireland is a conditional part of the United Kingdom unless and until a majority of people would vote for something different. Now, the, the UK government is going to offer unionist reassurance on that and, and restate Northern Ireland's uh, place in the UK. Uh, but I think that is more for comfort than it, it really add in sort of much weight to anything. So we're still waiting for the details of the agreement between the DUP and the government. But at what stage will we know with any certainty what's going to be in it? Well, uh, the, the details have, have literally just uh, been posted in the last couple of minutes as I've been talking to you. Uh, so it's essentially going to to show that the that the Northern Ireland uh, place in the UK internal market that the there'll be a reduction on tr uh, on all the checks that are, that uh, are due to take place. Uh, that in Northern Ireland won't diverge uh, from the rest of the UK uh, in a, in a way that is upsetting uh, to unionists. And I think that the fact that the other political parties who aren't um, of a unionist persuasion, you know, seem quite relaxed about what's likely uh, to be outlined uh, this afternoon. It's, it's quite, you know, an important note because it is a power sharing government in Northern Ireland. So essentially what we're going to have is sequencing over the next couple of days of everyone getting to pour over the detail of what's been agreed by the UK uh, and um, the, the DUP. Uh, then we're going to see a move to recall the Assembly, have a Speaker elected and then have First Ministers uh, elected and then get back to the to the normal sort of functioning devolved government that you would expect in most jurisdictions. But the list of problems for the incoming executive is extremely long. 
And is there a chance that any of this could be derailed? There's always a possibility of a last minute spanner in the works, but um, all of the sequencing so far is pointing towards a recall. The the current speaker, Alex Maskey, sent out a directive this afternoon, essentially uh, alerting uh, MLAs to be on standby at short notice uh, for a meeting of the Assembly. So unless something major happens, you know, this is sort of 99% there. Uh, and I wouldn't want to say that things couldn't fall apart, but it's un- it's unlikely that they would at this stage. They've got quite a lot of work to do, haven't they? Two years without a government. Yeah, the health service is in a mess. Uh, public uh, sector workers are on strike. There's going to be uh, strike action that takes place tomorrow. The public transport workers strike still is going ahead because members have been balloted and uh, they are not uh, holding out uh, for a promise while it looks very likely that Uh, Government's going to be back by the weekend, uh, early next week at the very latest. Um, They uh, still haven't got their pay claim honoured. And also the money that's part of the 3.3 billion deal uh, that the UK government agreed with the the parties that are eligible to form government. About 600 million of that is for public sector workers pay. uh, But that doesn't explain exactly uh, how it's going to be divvied up and it doesn't include future pay claims. So I'd imagine that the trade unions will be looking very carefully at what's been agreed. Okay, Amanda, thank you so much much. for joining us. Our guest today is the Labour MP for Nottingham East, Nadia Whittam. She entered Parliament in 2019 when she was just 23, which at time made her the official baby of the house. I was trying to remember what I was doing when I was 23, and I'm pretty sure that was the year I got so drunk that I fell asleep uh, on a train leaving London that was supposed to go to Croydon and I woke up in Brighton. Oh, that's I was... better than waking up in Croydon though, isn't it? <laughs> that's where my family's from, Nadia. My family's originally from Croydon too. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. That. I'm trying to envisage myself at 23 and I can't understand how it would have felt for me to walk into Parliament. What was that like for you? Oh, it was it was so wild. Honestly, it was such a baptism of fire because I I got selected so like voted by local party members yeah. to be the candidate just the I think it was the day before the snap election was called and that was kind of the first shock because no one expected the 23 year old yeah. to win the selection and then we were straight into this campaign got elected on early hours of Friday morning in parliament on Monday getting sworn in it was it was such a baptism of fire what made you stand as a as an mp you know, especially at that sort of young age, it's incredible. It it wasn't the plan. And if, what, if, what, I, wait, if I had plan? been able to choose my time, it wouldn't have been that time. But I guess like that was the kind of time that presented itself. Right. And um, the reason I joined the Labour Party and got active in politics was because of the bedroom tax. Right. That was back in 2013. Just so remind people was, what the bedroom tax is. So this was the, the policy that was introduced by the Tory-led coalition government that meant that if you live in a council home and you've got a spare room in your house, then you have to pay an extra tax on it. And I was so angry about this. that We'd had three years of austerity by that point. I was sick of like our benefits being cut, um, like access to services just being so shoddy. You know, I was seeing friends just waiting for what felt like forever on mental health waiting lists, on CAMS waiting lists. And um, yeah, so I got involved in the Labour Party. Um, Bedroom tax was the straw that broke the camel's back, really, even though it didn't affect um, us, it affected lots of people in my community. One thing that's well known about you is that when you became an MP, you pledged to keep just £35,000 of your then £86,000 yearly salary. It keeps you in line with the national average and you donate the rest to good causes. Why did you decide to do that and how is that going? So my take home is 35k mm-hmm. rather than the the salary. So right. I take home 35k and I donate the rest to local causes Um organisations in my community that are fighting austerity, that are serving the community in the face of these really brutal cuts. Mm. Um, And that's because, well, firstly, I think it's kind of a representative principle that if you come to Parliament as a workers representative, I didn't want to be on a wage that massively separated me from the community that I represent. Mm. And it's still like 
quite a lot of money. It's more than I was raised on. It's more than a lot of people earn. Um, but it's also about like redistributing what I'm earning and sharing it. Well, the subject of MP salaries comes up quite a lot. It's obviously quite a controversial issue. Just a few days ago, there was a story about the Conservative Minister, George Freeman. He's had to resign from his ministerial post because apparently his salary of 118, roughly, thousand pounds a year wasn't enough to pay his expenses. He's had a mortgage hike. Many of us are facing that. Um, how do you feel hearing that? It's it's a slap in the face, isn't it? I think particularly for for our generation, when like he's complaining about his his mortgage, this is the same party that says um, live within your means. Yeah. And Lee Anderson, the former uh, deputy chair, um, saying that people should just look for thirty p meal recipes. Yeah. Um, but when when you're saying that you can't afford your mortgage on an 118k salary and you're speaking to people who are in the midst of the worst cost of living crisis, the worst housing crisis, like our generation is spending half of their salaries on rent. Mm. Um, rent hikes just happening whenever the landlord fancies it, whenever the landlord fancies an extra skiing holiday, probably. Um, people are getting evicted. Like a... My my friends who um, are living in London in their late twenties, having to like shell out a grand for one room yeah. in a big flat share, and like, how can you even start of think of like starting a family or living a a reasonable proper life on that. I mean, one of the things, and this is just an aside, it always reminds me of, is like there's this particular reality TV trope where they'll take sometimes a politician or a celebrity and they make them live like real people. Yeah. And there's always this moment where they're like, oh God, it turns out it's quite hard. Yeah. And you have this moment being like, why is this a surprise? Like all those people had been saying for ages, this is really difficult. Yeah. So I feel like maybe we should invite this minister to be you. <laughs> like, just to <laughs> even, see even for that a TV would... show. But even that would give him like a, a a good standard of living. You know, I can get a, a delivery when I want. I can. Yeah. I'm not promoting delivery, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> awful, awful all workers' rights practices. Um, but you know, like I, I have a comfortable life. I know, but when he sits in Commons with his friends who all went skiing, he's going to be like so hurt that he couldn't go to a Chamonix or whatever <laughs> it was this week. Do you know what I mean? When um, Mary Black was in here on this podcast, she said that she'd been told by an MP who she didn't name. To be fair, she but she said she'd been told by an MP that if you're not a millionaire in this job, you're doing it wrong. You've really fucked up, Nadia. <laughs> Oh, what the yeah. fuck are you doing? Sorry, mate. <laughs> I can, that could have been a lot of people who had said that. <laughs> Earlier, we were discussing the big story of the week, the potential return of a power-sharing agreement in Northern Ireland. What's your reaction to the news? Um, I mean, for, for the last two years, the people of Northern Ireland have, have essentially not, not had a government. It's been run by civil servants on a sort of form of autopilot. Yeah. Um, I'm really relieved to hear um, about the um, restoration of power sharing. I think it's also important to remember like the reason why we got here in the first place yeah. is that the DUP resigned in protest of, um, of post-Brexit trade agreements. We're seeing play out in currently what everybody warned would happen at the time of the Brexit campaign. But I think there was no way near enough yeah. um, attention or scrutiny on that. And it must be frustrating for you to sit in the house with people who have manufactured that problem and who will, will now presumably take credit for resolving it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or just rewrite history. Like Andrea Leadsom said that... Um, that people were warned at the time that this might be tough for businesses. I don't think people leading the Brexit campaign did warn that. No. I think they they said the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were told we were going to be swimming in gold coins like Scrooge McDuck, basically. And, and like my favourite bit, <laughs> by favourite, I mean, you know, least favourite, bit was that when anyone mentioned anything, people would say, stop being negative. I was like, what is this, a Huns meeting? I'm just hanging out with my girls. Like, oh, we're <laughs> stop being negative. <laughs> That's not politics. What is this? No bad vibes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, Nadia, I'd like to talk to you about the difficult position the Labour Party has found itself in in response to the Israel-Gaza crisis. You were a number of Labour MPs who defied the party leadership to vote in support of a ceasefire in Gaza. Jess Phillips resigned as a shadow minister for doing so. Another of your colleagues, the MP Kate Ossimore, has been suspended by the party for adding a reference to Gaza to a tweet marking International Holocaust Day. I just want to play you this clip from a recent fundraising event in Stockport where the deputy leader, Angela Rayner's speech, was interrupted by a man called Dalil Al-Nadir who'd lost his mum, brother, pregnant sister-in-law and two nieces in the bombing of Gaza. I lost my family in Gaza. Just a second, I want to show you my mum. I lost my family in Gaza. If this is for your take you I just say, Angela Rayner, you can't decide to exterminate. What kind of family is that? Um, just to explain to listeners, the clip that we're watching and you're hearing uh, ends with a man being manhandled out of the room uh, while Angela Rayner looks on. Um, Nadia, how do you feel seeing obviously very distressing scenes like that playing out? Honestly, I just, I feel heartbroken for for that man who I, I cannot, none of us can comprehend mm. the, the scale of the death and destruction in Gaza. I... I I could not imagine losing multiple members of my family while the world sort of just looks on and and shrugs essentially 1% of the the whole population has been killed um 2 million people are being deprived of clean water and food they're on the brink of starvation we're hearing stories about children who are writing their names on their hands so that when when they're brought out of the rubble people know who they are um children having to bury their younger siblings amputations being performed without without anesthetic it's it's beyond comprehension and it's it's not surprising that 71% of the UK public supports the ceasefire and I completely agree with them. That is what I've been calling for since since October. Um, and so what's going on? Why, why can't Labour adopt this position? I, I have also been frustrated, very frustrated with um, Labour's positioning on this. Um, I'm glad that it has begun to shift, but I think that is still happening too slowly and not far enough. Um, and I think some of the messaging, it can seem quite contradictory. So I, I understand that, you know, it's a very fast moving situation and people are being put on the spot in in media interviews, but the party needs to be very clear about where we stand and that needs to be in support of an immediate ceasefire um, for a, a proper peace process that begins with ending the blockade of Gaza, ending the illegal occupation of, of the West Bank, ending illegal settlements, um, and for a solution that that supports the the rights and the the self-determination of of both peoples. And we need to be clear and consistent It was good that. to hear you say that Labour's shifting a bit on that because as a Labour voter, I'm on the fence at the moment, I'll be honest, um, and this whole situation, it's not it's not warming me <laughs> to the cause or to the party, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that because I, I don't feel that that's necessarily been communicated to me as someone who's interested in politics and cares about this issue. I don't think I'm alone in that either. The uh, Guardian's front page had a story about Labour losing support amongst uh, its Muslim community, but also younger people, urban people, millennial people. You know, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of us who are really unhappy. I mean, are, are you concerned about this loss of support? I mean, when I say that we've seen a shift, now the, the position is for... Uh, a permanent and sustainable ceasefire um, but that obviously should have been the position a very long time ago and you know um, whipping an abstention on the SNP's amendment that would have um, that would have called for the UK Parliament to mm. um, be pushing for a ceasefire was in my view the wrong thing to do that's why I, I voted for that amendment. Um, I am very concerned yeah. about not not just about 
that polling. You know, I'm glad that the polling has happened. I'm glad that it's been reported that the party is worried about this um, because there obviously is an electoral consequence of taking these positions, but it's it's also a moral imperative. Mm. I've received more emails about Israel and Palestine than I have on any other subject since becoming an MP by quite some way. And that's not just from Muslim constituents, it's from constituents of all demographics. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we should always say, and our sister shows, Pod Save America and Pod Save the World, are also very keen to stress this, that the internal debates within the Democrat Party and the Labour Party are not the priority here. The priority here is uh, preventing further civilian loss of life, getting hostages released. That That's the important thing here. I worry that we live in like very cruel times. Um, the only reason I mention that is because I'm going to ask you about another really cruel thing, in my view, that's been going on, which is about the safety of Rwanda Bill. I know it's something you care a lot about. It's something that we care a lot about on this show. And you also went to the uh, Bibby Stockholm, the accommodation barge, which is more in Portland off the coast of Dorset. What was that like? What did you make of it? It was, um, it was horrific. I wrote last year to the Home Secretary twice, well, two Home Secretaries, yeah, because yeah. the first time it was Suella Braverman and then it was James Cleverly, to seek permission to enter the Bibby Stockholm barge to see for myself. And I did this alongside other MPs. We wanted to see for ourselves the the conditions on mm. board. What is the government hiding? We didn't get that permission, so I just went anyway and spoke to the the people on there seeking asylum. And the conditions that they described to me, they were, it's like a prison. Healthcare is completely inadequate. Um, I I spoke to somebody who was a torture survivor. In, In the Home Office's own guidelines, it says that torture survivors should not be housed on this they're not asking for for special treatment. They want the right to work so that they can, you know, live normally in the community with everyone else rather than being forced to live on £49.18p a week. Yeah. Um, they want the their cases to be dealt with quickly because it's a political decision to to have let this um this backlog grow and build um, and they want safe and legal routes Mm. you know if you want to stop channel boat crossings then you need to introduce safe and legal routes because what the what the government's current policy reads like is like a, a trafficker's charter we get quite a lot of correspondence from younger listeners and a message we often get is a kind of disillusionment with politics in general at the moment. I, I just want to play this and then ask you a question off the back of it. it. This voice note has come in from Charlie and it's a response to a message we played a few weeks ago. Hello, my name's Charlie. I'm calling you from Malvern in the Midlands. Um, I was um, reminded when you had your message from your 18-year-old in Shrewsbury who said that she'd met someone who was not interested in news, not interested in politics, didn't want to get involved. Um, it reminded me of friends of mine who have been very reluctant to get off their bums and vote. And a lot of the time, the message is that there isn't anyone for them to vote for. Um, So I just wanted to get your thoughts on spoiling your ballot paper. Uh, A little while ago, a comedian was talking about how valuable that can be and how there are statistics on spoiled ballots. Um, So just wondering what your thoughts are if everybody who didn't want to vote went to the polling station and spoiled their ballot paper and wrote something useful like, none of these people represent me, or something, um, whether that would have any impact at all on, you know, how politics works in this country. Um, It would be amazing if it did, uh, but I don't know how optimistic I am. What do you make of that? I think that's completely the wrong strategy. I understand why why people are are very frustrated um, about the political system that we live in. I think think it is a, a bit of a myth that young people are apolitical though. Mm, yeah. um, we're a very politicised generation and we've seen that through the the mass mobilisations around climate, now around Gaza. Um, but I think the problem and, and what Charlie highlights is people feel disillusioned with yeah. mainstream politics. Yeah. They feel that they're not listened to by politicians. And I think 
there's this vicious circle, isn't there, with political parties not offering policies for young people to vote for, many young people then not voting, and then political parties not not yeah. making that offer. And it's it's a responsibility of political parties to break that vicious cycle. I do think it's extremely important to vote if you believe that any change at all is possible through Parliament, no matter how minor in in the grand scheme of things, then it's important to engage with that parliamentary system. Even if you think that the Labour Party should be offering more, I would like the Labour Party to be going further. But I think voting, it takes five minutes. You go and you choose the party that will that will move us furthest towards the the kind of world you want. And then you can spend the rest of your time campaigning for something even better. So can I ask you a question? And this is one that's been on my mind for a lot. Traditionally, when I voted Labour in the past, it's not because I felt especially represented by every aspect of it, but I knew that there was a big tent and there were people that were a bit more like-minded to me in that tent. And I trusted that that movement together would nudge things in a direction that I wanted to see things to go. Right now with the party, my concern is that all the lefties are gone, basically. And so I'm scared that the tent is not big. You are one of those lefties. I'm sure it's very lonely. I wondered if that idea of the tent, is that something that can still survive? Is that something that exists? I completely agree with you. Um, The the broad tent within the party is is so important. I think it's what makes the party stronger, you know, when we listen to each other, when we have disagreements, um, but we disagree well. And um, we we do that democratically through debates. Um, clearly, I mean, there are no um, MPs from the left of the party in the shadow cabinet. I think that is a problem. Um, I would like to see the party listening to to the left, um, because I think we still do have a lot of the answers to the crises that we're facing. You know, things like um, a fifteen pound, fifteen pound an hour minimum wage that would not only improve people's lives, putting money in their pockets, but that money will go into the local economy and grow the economy. Um, things like rent controls that would mean that people could actually have security rather than being scared of of their landlord increasing their rent whenever they want to mm. um and I, I think it's it's really important for um for those views to be listened to and taken on board if we're to have a chance of fighting the cost of living crisis and fighting the climate crisis <laughs> So you were on the front cover of the Gay Times recently. They awarded you for their their future fighter title. Congratulations for a Thank start. You. Very well deserved. Uh, hearing you speak there, I'm like, yeah, future fighter. I can hear it. I can hear it. Uh, you're a huge supporter of the LGBTQIA community. So I wanted to ask you about what the fuck is going on with this trans debate? Oh, my God. I don't think it will go away if an election is called because the Tories have already said that they... Um, that they intend to fight the election on culture war issues. Yeah, I, every um, week in PMQs, Rishi Sunak, regardless of the question he's asked, seems to bring it up, which, I mean, at points it seems like he's he's lost complete like, is contact Is he playing a reality. drinking game? Yeah. Or is he, like... <laughs> it, it is a culture war drinking game. It's uh, boat crossings, Keir Starmer doesn't know what a woman is. Like, it really is, like, it, it, it's... It's a bingo card of absolute prejudice at this point. Like, it, it, I, I'm, I feel nothing but like sympathy for the transgender community because they're just being used as a political football. I mean, what's it like for you as a representative of the wider LGBTQIA it's the te- it's the, community? It's the tenor as well. It's so nasty. It definitely feels that like any level of decorum or respect on this issue is just gone, disappeared. It's it's disgraceful, and it like the. The way that it's being weaponized, you know, like we we laugh about Rishi Sunak bringing this up at every opportunity, even when there isn't an opportunity. Um, But like this is people's lives and it's incredibly serious. What we're seeing is the the Tory government and the right wing press, they're waging an ideological war on just the the right of trans people to simply live their lives and already 
the the trans community and of course the the wider LGBTQ community faces massive discrimination. Two in three young trans people um, are bullied at school because of their gender identity. Um, Trans people face disproportionate rates of domestic and sexual violence. People are waiting seven years just for an initial NHS assessment and uh, are then, you know, sometimes taking their own lives as they're languishing on those waiting lists. But instead of improving that situation, we're going backwards. And even when I look back to when I was elected first in, in 2019, at that time, the, the Conservative government had promised to ban conversion therapy and to reform the Gender Recognition Act to make it easier to get a, a gender recognition certificate. Now, They've they've dropped um, their pledge to um, to ban conversion therapy, and instead of reforming the the Gender Recognition Act to make it better, they're talking about they say reforming, but um, watering down the Equality Act, changing it to remove the the rights and protections that we already have. And yeah, this is. This is because they're using trans people and sometimes it's trans people, sometimes it's migrants, sometimes it's people of colour, um, but they will always use a scapegoat to mm. divide and rule, to say to people, it's it's not us who are responsible for your for your problems, for your drop in living standards. It's this, this bogeyman that will continue, um, particularly as the, the Tories... Uh, are focused on that during an election time because they have no solutions to offer. Of course they don't have any solutions. They're the ones who cause the problems in the first place. So just before you go, we want to ask you just for your reaction to the news that Shadow Chancellor Rachel Rees confirmed that Labour wouldn't be bringing back the banker bonus cap. Obviously, I'm very disappointed by that news, but that's not going to stop me from fighting, not just for um, bankers' bonuses to be capped. You know, this was something that was introduced um after the 2008 financial crash and it's ever more relevant and necessary now that we've got a massive gulf between the the very rich and the very poor um, and that inequality is is only growing. Um, but we also need things like wealth taxes, like to redress that balance, to redistribute wealth and power in this country, but also, you know, to to fund our public services. And that doesn't have to be very, very radical. Like you could, for example, equalise capital gains and income tax. Yeah. Something so radical that the Tory Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, was in support of it. Yeah, yeah. That would raise £8 billion a year. Yeah. And these are the things that we, the, the Labour Party is going to have to look at in government. Because they always keep saying they don't want to turn the taps on. But turn them on, I'm thirsty. Like, everybody's <laughs> parched. <laughs> it's hard not to get disillusioned when you hear things like that. <laughs> but you think that, I mean, look, you're still in the party. You still believe in the power of the party. And I just want to just hear from you, like, should we still have faith in them? I don't think it's about having faith. I don't think we should have faith in in anyone but our our collective power to to make sure that things happen. And I absolutely think that people need to vote Labour at the next election. We need to get the Tories out, and we we need to bring ourselves closer to the the kind of world that that we need. Nadia, thank you so much for coming in. Um, we really appreciate your time and it, good luck with the next year. It's a big old campaign. Yes. Thought, we so appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. No, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Crooked's newest limited series, Dissident at the Doorstep, is dropping their fifth episode this Saturday. This podcast is a wild ride following the true story of one of China's most prominent human rights activists who later turned into a Trump MAGA supporter a few years later. Listen to new episodes of Dissident at the Doorstep every Saturday, available on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Coco, who's your PSUK Hero of the Week? 
So my hero of the week is the drag artist Crystal for taking on and beating the actor turned right wing troll Lawrence Fox. So a high court judge has ruled that Lawrence Fox, former GB News host and leader of the Reclaim Party, did libel Crystal, whose real name is Colin Seymour, as well as Stonewall trustee Simon Blake and actor Nicola Thorpe. Nish's mate. My friend. Exactly. Congratulations to them all. <laughs> well, Fox called them all pedos. Yeah. You're called your mate, yeah. a pedo, right? Which is not really cool f- for anyone. Yeah. Um, and that was on a heated exchange on Twitter. So th- there was quite a lot of counterclaims. Fox claimed that he'd been defamed when uh, Crystal called him a racist, for example. And it, it is all a bit complicated, but the judgment was emphatic. Mrs. Justice Collins Rice said Fox's comments were seriously harmful, defamatory, and baseless. Doing a victory lap of the TV studios the next day, Crystal absolutely went for it. Uh, she pulled no punches in, in in commenting what a nasty man he'd been through the proceedings and, and really hitting home why it was significant and why it was important to not let these comments slide. But she did it all in high heels and dressed up like Elle from Legally Blonde. <laughs> so uh, listen, that's the only way to dress after a legal victory. So it, it, it's, it's quite fabulous. I think if I'd known at the outset that it was going to be three and a half years later that we'd still be talking about this, I I may have thought twice, but um, honestly, he's he's a bully and and accusations of pedophilia against people in the queer community, against drag queens, these are old, old tropes and um, I didn't want to stand for it. I didn't want to let that slide. It, it, It honestly felt like if I didn't pursue this to the very end, that it was a tacit admission as well. I needed to I needed to see it through and make it clear that there was no basis in fact to this. So that clip was from Sky News. Oh, poor Crystal. So she wasn't able to celebrate the victory um, with a few drinks, as you'd kind of expect, because she agreed to do that appearance on Sky. That meant a 3 a.m. start to fit in two hours of meticulous drag makeup. So listen, for taking on and beating one of the I'd say highest profile right-wing trolls out there and doing it while looking fabulous. There's only one hero of the week and it has got to be Crystal. Absolutely outstanding choice. So, Nish, who's your villain of the week? Uh, It's Tory MP and Trade and Industry Secretary, Kemi Badenoch. Good old Kemi. She was doing the rounds uh, in the TV studios at the weekend. Uh, She was on Laura Coonsberg's show on the BBC. And she's been urging unity and urging the Conservative Party to get behind Rishi Sunak. After Liz Truss left, uh, I, stood, uh, I stood up and said, I'm not running again. Rishi is the person who should do the job. And I did so because I'd worked with him in the Treasury. I knew he had a handle on the economy. But also, I saw just during that previous leadership campaign just how many nasty and unpleasant personal attacks mm. that he had been getting. And I thought, this is a good guy. He does the right thing. And that's the team I want to be on. Not on the team of the bullies or the people putting out nasty personal abuse, but on the p- team of people who are focused on delivering for the country. Then, uh, later on in the week, it was revealed that she was the member of a conservative WhatsApp group called Evil Plotters. That's the name of the WhatsApp group, is Evil Plotters. I'm sick of the country being governed by banter. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sick to the back teeth of it. You're not organising a stag or hen do. You're supposed to be running the country. And the focus of the Conservative Party is on its own survival slash its own self-immolation. So Kemi is pretty Machiavellian in her villainy. She sort of largely has gone under the radar. She's been letting other people do her dirty work while she sits back and waits for the opportunity to take over as leader. We've discussed on the show when uh, Kinde Andrews was on that he still believes she's going to be Britain's first Mm. black prime minister. But the fact that she has been talking about how they need to be more unified whilst also being a member of uh, this evil plotters WhatsApp group it, it is an absolute hypocrisy. You know, we're at the point where um, a lot of uh, people that work within the NHS are suggesting that they need to declare a state of emergency to help stay, uh, save the service. There are real crises going on in this country. But once again, the government of the day is solely focused on its own internal psychodrama. And Kemi Badenoch this week is the protagonist Protagonist of that psychodrama that distracts from the real issues of governing the country. I also can't fucking stand her. Bear in mind that I feel like we don't talk about this enough. Kerry admitted that in 2008, she hacked Harriet Harman's website in order to put up a fake post saying that she was supporting Boris Johnson to be London mayor. 
The thing about conservatives is they are exactly who you think they are. <laughs> Instead of going out and getting hammered like most people in their late 20s, she was hacking Labour MPs' websites to spread bullshit about them. Also, I think the only person that can use evil plotters is Stephen King. <laughs> it, it's pathetic. Can, can we... Is there a way that we can make it a decree that ministers can't have WhatsApps? Uh, like, they can only use WhatsApps for their personal use. WhatsApp <laughs> groups are for, like, talking about the traitors and planning weekends away. They're not for governing the fucking country. I mean, I agree with all of the above, but just as an aside, what is the weirdest name you've had in for a WhatsApp? Oh, I mean, so many. Okay. It's, come, it's come to the point where you look at WhatsApp groups sometimes, you think, I don't even remember what this in-joke is a reference to. <laughs> I have no clue what this in-joke is a reference to. What does poppy a sax on it mean? I don't know. I don't know, but I've got 25 messages on my phone from it. From, from popping your socks on? Poppy a sax on it. No idea. Poppy a sax That's on it? That's a genuine name of a WhatsApp group I'm part of. I don't even of. know what those words Absolutely were, Absolutely no said. idea. Absolutely no idea. <laughs> By all means, uh, listeners, uh, send us your weirdest named WhatsApp group. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Send us the name of a WhatsApp group that you can't remember why it's called that. <laughs> so while we're on the subject of WhatsApps, we should say that former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon is in front of the COVID inquiry as we speak. She's being quizzed about her WhatsApps. She says she did not use informal communications like WhatsApp to reach decisions or to have substantial discussions. She's been questioned by lead counsel Jamie Dawson KC. Sturgeon admitted to deleting her messages, but said that everything of relevance was available on the public record. And next week, we'll be joined by Nicola Sturgeon's successor as Scotland's First Minister, Hamza Youssef. So if you've got a question for him, send it to us by emailing psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk. It's also always nice to hear your voices. So do send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514644572. Internationally, that's plus four four seven five one four six four four five seven two. We want to hear your weirdest named WhatsApp group. And I will be changing ours from PSUK <laughs> discussion to Coco Khan's Weird Dreams. Don't forget to follow Pod Save the UK on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. And if you're as opinionated as we are, consider leaving us a review. Our WhatsApp group is just called PSUK. I know, it's so awful. We I'm should change, get another I'm one. I'm changing that this week. Oh, really? <laughs> Coco's Weird Dreams. <laughs> I'm changing it to Coco's Weird Dreams as soon as we finish oh, recording. Because this whole this whole podcast is a weird dream. Oh, come on. This isn't Dallas. <laughs> Another up-to-date reference for our younger I, listeners. I didn't even get that. What is that? <laughs> there was a whole plot line in the soap Dallas, the 80s soap, that was uh, completely undone when it was revealed it was one of the characters' of dreams. <laughs> really? Yeah. Listen, they don't make TV like that they anymore, don't do make they? TV like that anymore. <laughs> Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by Will Darkin and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer David Dargahi. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. We could do like a, like a little fade out dreamy music now. <laughs> Wake up, Coco. Wake up. It was all a dream. The Tories didn't win the 2010 election. Wow. Wow.